You sounded great in worship. Is there, there was like a whole section over here. You were bringing it. I was very impressed. Just wanted to bring you up to speed on a couple of things real quick before I uh, get started with my talk this morning. Uh, the first is um, we've had to make a little adjustment on some timing and plans for our building project, expansion project that's coming up. It has to do with the bump out section of the lobby and the youth ministry space underneath. What's happened is, is that we've run into problems with ceiling heights for the lower level. And in order to accommodate that, we thought we had fixed that problem by taking some steps. We would have to dig out even further and that creates access issues and code issues. And we actually don't have a solution that's uh, viable financially to do that. So there will still be some uh, bump out on the lobby. What we've decided is that we will do a complete remodel of the current student ministry space, and when this project is completed, we'll plan another project to create another uh, student ministry space. The news was shared with our uh, students last Wednesday night, and I wish you could have been in the room uh, to see their response. Um, they just leaned into it and became very excited about having a part in redesigning and, and redoing the space that they are in. And they do trust that when we say that next space is coming, that it actually will. So I just wanted you to be up to speed and aware of that. Second thing to make you aware of is that the last Sunday of this uh, month is our uh, annual business meeting where we call it Vision Sunday. On that day, you will have the opportunity uh, to select, if you are a member of Calvary Assembly, to select the next person who will serve on a church council. The two individuals whose names are being presented are Greg Alquist and Steve Mao. And so what I'd like you to do is to be in prayer about that selection process. We think that if we just start calling people up and saying, well, I like this person, you should vote for them, that what we get is our will. We think that if we pray and just vote according to cast our ballot, according to the person we believe God is directing, we honestly believe that what we get is God's will. And God knows what we're going to face over the course of the next three years and who would be the best fit at the council table. And so just keep that process in prayer between now and then. So what I'd like to do this morning is talk for just a few minutes about uh, what do you do when you seem to be stuck in a place that seems to be unfair. There are lots of things that happen in our lives that we wish didn't happen, but we know we made some mistakes, some miscalculations, it's on us. But there are occasions when it seems like we were trying to do the right thing and thought we did the right thing, and we are still seem to be suffering under what seems to be unfair conditions. And we kind of approach Scripture, and there are verses in the Bible that seem to indicate that if you do the right thing, then you will get a good thing. That when you choose the better choice, you wind up getting a reward. And then we feel in a, we're in a situation that that doesn't seem to be occurring. You should know that that is actually not unusual, and there's lots of Scripture that addresses this. We're going to read a little bit more Scripture than usual today, uh, but it is a beautiful picture written by a man named Asaph. In case you don't know, not all of the Psalms were written by David. He, mo he authored most of the Psalms, but there were some that were written by others. Asaph is one of those prominent writers in Psalms as well. And this is the lyrics to the song that he wrote. He said, surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. Sounds like we're off to a good start. But as for me, my feet almost slipped. I nearly lost my foothold. I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. They seem to have no struggles. Their bodies seem to be healthy and strong. They seem to be free from common human burdens that they're not plagued by human ills. Pride seems to be their necklace, and they clothe themselves with violence. And from their callous hearts comes iniquity. Their evil imaginations have no limits. They scoff. They speak with malice and with arrogance. They threaten oppression. Their mouths lay claim to heaven, and their tongues take possession of the earth. Therefore, their people turn to them and drink up waters in abundance. And they say, how could God know? Does the Most High know anything? And this is what the wicked are like. Always free of care, they go on amassing wealth. Surely, in vain, I have kept my heart pure and washed my hands with innocence. 
all day long. I've been afflicted, and every morning brings new punishments. Boy, that is a lousy place to live, isn't it? Listen, I'm going to read that verse again, because some of you know that address. You feel like you've been there. All day long, I've been afflicted, and every morning brings new punishments. If I had spoken out like that, I would have betrayed your children. When I tried to understand all this, it troubled me deeply. Till I entered the sanctuary of God. Then I understood their final destiny. Surely you've placed them on slippery ground and cast them down to ruin. How suddenly they are destroyed, completely swept away by terrors. They're like a dream when one awakes. When you rise, Lord, you will despise them as fantasies. When my heart was grieved and my spirit embittered, I was senseless and ignorant. I was a brute beast before you, yet I am always with you. You hold me by my right hand. You guide me with your counsel, and afterward you will take me into glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And earth has nothing I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Those who are far from you will perish. You destroy all who are unfaithful to you. But as for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the sovereign Lord my refuge. I will tell of your deeds. It's a fascinating insight into how to process a season when you feel like life is being unfair and even when you've done the right thing, you seem to be getting a negative outcome. What happens is, is that when we're facing painful realities, we can begin to process that information and it gives rise to doubt. We start asking questions we wouldn't ordinarily ask and we start making assumptions we wouldn't ordinarily make. That doubt begins to rise and we wonder if God really has our back or if he is even aware of what's going on in our lives or if he cares what's going on in our lives. Now, some people think that spirituality and a life of faith is all about finding a pathway where you avoid all difficulty and suffering. And in that model, if you are doing life right, then life just works. There's another path that people get on, and that's the path where they assume that spirituality is always picking the hard, painful thing. They've interpreted the passage of Scripture where Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me, as though you have to experience pain in every single element of life. And somehow there's spiritual benefit for that. And what I would tell you is both of those are extremes. God does not call us to avoid pain, and God doesn't call us to choose pain, but he does call us to endure pain when it comes. Jesus actually told us that in this world we will have trouble. We should not be surprised. So what can we do when life seems unfair? And the first is don't be surprised. This is what he says, right? As for me, my feet had almost slipped. Slipping is always a surprise. When, you, when, you, when you're sliding, you're doing that on purpose. When you're slipping, you didn't see it coming. Uh, if you've ever had one of those moments, I was, I was taking our little dog out on the patio, and, and I went to make a quick move, and when I did that, there was ice underneath me, and I went down, and I, it felt like I broke every bone from my shoulder to my foot couldn't breathe deeply for weeks. I know. Didn't see that coming. <laughs> and, and my dog wasn't like Lassie to go get help. She just looked at me. <laughs> Useless. <laughs> Jesus actually forecasts that we would have sorrow in our lives. And what he tells us is this is not heaven. That heaven is a place where there is no sorrow and everything works the way that it's supposed to, but this is not that place yet. Jesus told us that, he, what he tells us is, I didn't promise that you would never experience difficulty. What I promised is that I would always be with you no matter what you face. That's the promise that we have to learn to cling to. The challenge is, is that our tendency is to try to use Jesus to get what we really want. And so rather than allowing Jesus to rule, we, teach, we, we, we uh, try to treat Jesus like a tool. And that's not how it works. He is Lord of heaven and earth. 
So don't be surprised. Secondly, don't make assumptions about God. Verse 11 said, they say, how would God know? Does the Most High know anything? It's easy to start assuming that somehow your situation slipped past his memo box. That somehow he's not aware of what's going on in your life. Or maybe even worse than that, maybe he's brought this on you. Maybe you deserve some form of punishment and you're not sure what happened or why. Or maybe you think God actually plays favorites. He does some things for some people, but not for me. It's very easy to begin to assign assumptions and and interpretations to the difficulties that we're going through. What you need to know is that those assumptions are not based on truth. They're based on pain. We have to be careful about the conclusions we come to when we're managing and processing pain. This is what it said in, in Scripture. It says, my heart was grieved and my spirit embittered and I was a senseless and ignorant. I was like a brute beast before you. When, when we're being pummeled by painful realities, we don't think very clearly. We just tend to absorb and respond. And so we need to be careful about the assumptions that we're making. Put your hope in God, not in the outcome. There's a great passage of scripture in the book of Isaiah that says, those who wait on the Lord will renew their strength. And I've had people come to me and say, I've been waiting a long time and I'm not getting any stronger. And I ask them, are you waiting on God or are you waiting on something to change? A lot of times we are waiting for what we want and we're not waiting on God at all. And God doesn't promise that that will make you strong. If we wait on him, it does. Uh, Thirdly, don't make predictions about yourself. Uh, He said it, right? I read the verse twice. All day long I've been afflicted and every morning brings new punishments. It's always going to be like this. It's going to get worse every single day. I had an uncle. This was his saying. He said, somebody told me once, smile, it could be worse. So I smiled and it got worse. That's just... (laughs) And if you knew his life, you'd believe it because he had a rough life. We start thinking it's always going to be like this. I'm never going to get through this. And we start making assessments of ourselves, not just predictions about what's going to happen, but I'm not good. I'm not good at being a friend. I'm not good at being a parent. I'm not good at being a spouse. I'm lousy at this. It's, It's never going to work out for me. And those are horrible predictions to make. And once again, we're just processing information based on pain, not on the kinds of things God says or what he teaches us. What's true is that while you are going through a difficult circumstance, the cement is still wet. You, you, can, you can be changed. You can, you can grow. You can learn. You can develop. You, you, can, you can learn new things and skills and practices. You, you can become more than you are right now. And that's an important thing to process when we're going through painful realities in our lives. So you might not be in control of the circumstances, but you can control how you respond to them. Remember in the first week of this series, we talked about this. We've been created for relationship with God and with others. And we have been created to exercise authority, that we're not just a product of the forces that surround us in our environment, that there's authority we can exercise. And you might not be able to change the situation you're in, but you can take authority over yourself. That's the best place to start exercising authority. And choose how you will respond and react. There's another thing. We can take a sentence and just by adding one word on the end of it, it can change it completely, all right? So, I can't do this. Okay, let's add one word. Yet. Because that indicates that there's hope for growth, increasing capacity. I'm not in a good place. Yet. I am not out of pain yet. Just when you're giving yourself some of your negative self-talk, and we all do it, just learn to put a yet in at the end of that sentence and see how it changes your outcome. There are things that we think we can't live without in life, and then we discover when we lose them or they are taken away, we actually can. It's disappointing and it's painful, but I will tell you, There's a great freedom that comes to the individual that learns that you actually can process life without some of the things you think you can't. Very powerful truth to learn. So, 
the theme of the psalm seems to change right about the time you get to verse 16. And I'd like to spend the rest of our time together on that change. And, and the, the next thing is, learn to take the long view. Learn to take the long view. Your life is not a sprint. It's a marathon. This is what he says in verse 17. Till I entered the sanctuary of God, then I understood their final destiny. That, that what I'm seeing is not the final outcome. That what I'm going through is not eternal. It's temporary. And uh, our tendency is to define ourselves by our failures. And I'm so grateful that when God sees us, he doesn't just see the mistake that we made. He sees our potential. And so he defines us by what we can be rather than our failure. So we can learn to take a longer view in life. He takes the long view of us. We can learn to take that view as well. And then lastly, trust God's plan. Trust God's plan. This is what it says in verse 22. I'm always with you. You hold me by my right hand. You guide me with your counsel. And afterward, you will take me into glory. Now, once again, it doesn't mean there's no difficulties. God, God's plan does not guarantee no problems. But uh, let's suppose uh, we're in February. Let's suppose around the end of December of last year, you took a look at yourself in the mirror, and, and then you saw a picture of yourself in a yearbook. And you go, yeah, something's got to change. And so you made a series of decisions. Now, whether you've kept up with them or not, you probably thought about this, and you thought, I need to start doing some sort of aerobic exercise. And uh, I, I, I need to probably do some sort of weight training, and I need to adjust my caloric intake just a little bit. And here's the thing about that that you should know. None of that is easy. Have you ever heard somebody, they go on this really strict diet, and they say, they say something like, 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 all you can eat is bird food or something. I don't know. Just, and then they say, oh, I feel great. I don't know why I ever ate like that before. I mean, this is so good. Just give them 60 days. They are not going to be eating bird food anymore. They're going to be back eating all the stuff that they used to eat. That's just how humans are. But there's an expression that we have when we want to get in shape. I will start the expression. You will finish the expression. No pain you know it. Because you know what? Aerobic exercise hurts. How many have heard about a runner's high? It's a lie. <laughs> Somebody tells us that if we run far enough, we will experience euphoria. It has never happened to me. I have run as far as I can run. And it never happened to me. Lifting weights, I mean, shin splints, all this stuff that happens. And then, and then you, you're, you're saying no to all the... I, do, I, th I have a suspicion that before the fall, ice cream and chocolate chip cookies were healthy. <laughs> and broccoli was bad for you. And after the fall, everything got turned around. And so, no pain, no... If we're going to improve how we look, how we feel, it's going to require some exercises and some actions that seem painful to us. You should understand that when you begin to get in shape, you start using muscles you haven't been using, and you do feel a little bit sore. When you start going through difficulties, you start exercising a set of spiritual and emotional muscles you haven't been using. You start learning how to be more truthful. We think we're really honest until we start going through some very difficult things and, and we learn how to speak truth in difficult circumstances or we can become more grateful because it is, it is not in the, the composition of human beings to be grateful when they have too much. The greatest gratitude I've ever heard expressed have always been from those who lost something and they didn't realize how grateful they should have been to have their health or their family or their job. It's just absolutely amazing. We can become more grateful. We can become more humble. If everything goes the way we want, it is hard not to become proud and arrogant. We start looking down at other people. If they would just try harder and you have to know that is a 
That is a great burden to put on somebody who's trying with everything they've got. We learn to be more compassionate. When you've actually been through something, you know and have a unique awareness of what actually helps in those circumstances. God has a plan. As it turns out, the faith journey that we are on is not intended just to make life easy for us. It's about making us braver and stronger and more resilient and more hopeful. That's the journey that God has us on. That's God's plan for our lives. So if you could see what God sees in you, if you could see your potential, you would embrace the difficulties and endure the hardships, not as a punishment, but as an exercise to build you up to be all that God intends you to be. Now, I know you might think, well, it's easy for God to say he's never had to suffer. Just think about that. Some people will go, well, you know, Jesus suffered, God didn't. Okay? So if you're a parent and you've ever had your child go through something difficult, that is a really difficult thing. Our Heavenly Father has suffered, and Jesus did too. He was in a painful situation, and he actually prayed for other options. And that, those options did not present themselves. So what did he do? He endured. He didn't run away. He didn't give up. And in case you're wondering what motivated him, it wasn't a defiance against a Roman occupation or a stubbornness that no one was going to break him down. He's always been motivated by the exact same thing, and that is love. The reason he endured the cross was love. In Matthew chapter 11, it tells us this, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened. If life is not working out, if life seems heavy and hard, if you are not happy where you are, come to me and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. So what is a yoke? In our culture, we're not as familiar with this, but a yoke was a way that you harness the energy of an animal to be able to do something significant with it. For example, like plowing a field. And you might take a team of oxen and, and you would bring them together, but the yoke wasn't just to combine their energy, it was also to steer. It was a steering mechanism for those animals. And this is what Jesus is saying. If you feel like you're in a horrible place and nothing is working out, come to me. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me start steering your life. Because my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I know where I will bring you. Jesus sees our final destination. And that's why he's committed to us. If you begin to see your final destination, you will be committed to him. Let's bow our heads this morning. Uh, Father, I know, I know there are, are people in this room right now that um, they've been going through a very difficult season. There's probably a fair amount of fear about what the future could hold. A lot of fatigue, just a weariness. How long does this have to last? And especially when we've been giving it our best effort, it just seems so horribly unfair. Uh, would you help us today? Not to make any false assumptions about you or unrealistic predictions about ourselves. Would you help us take this amazing step of just coming to you with all of our weariness and all of our fear and giving you permission to start steering our life? We trust you with the reins of our life today. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand together.